Uh, the University of Louisville Phi Beta Kappa Lecture is delivered each year by a nationally recognized scholar whose work reflects the importance and the value of the liberal arts in the academic world and in society at large. It is intended to honor the mission of Phi Beta Kappa, that love of learning is the guide of life. It is hard to think of anyone who better embodies these words than our guest tonight, James Shapiro. Dr. Shapiro is the Larry Miller Professor of English at Columbia University and one of the world's leading experts on Shakespeare and his times. Now, it's typical when introducing scholars to read off the accomplishments listed on their CV. Um, but if I were to do that for Professor Shapiro, instead of celebrating Shakespeare's 400th anniversary, we'd still be here for his 500th. Um, so I'll just list some of the highlights. He's the author of six books, including Shakespeare and the Jews, Oberammergau, The Troubling Story of the World's Most Famous Passion Play, 1599, A Year in the Life of William Shakespeare, and most recently, The Year of Lear, Shakespeare in 1606, which was just shortlisted for the 2016 Phi Beta Kappa Book Award. He is also the editor of Shakespeare in America, an anthology published by the Modern Library, for which the former president, Bill Clinton, wrote the introduction. Among his many, many awards are the Bainton Prize, the BBC Samuel Johnson Prize, the Lionel Trilling Award, the James Tate Black Prize, and fellowships from the Huntington Library, the National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Guggenheim Foundation. He's presented the BBC documentaries, The King and the Playwright, and The Mysterious Mr. Webster. He serves as scholar in residence at New York's Public Theater, and by the way, before you ask, just don't mention Hamilton. Just don't ask him for tickets. It, you know, <laughs> And he sits on the board of directors of the Royal Shakespeare Company and the board of governors of the Folger Shakespeare Library. Indeed, Professor Shapiro was the fellow who first suggested that the first folio be sent on tour. Um, now, that's all of his accomplishments. But um, before I yield the podium to him, I also want to tell one story that he just told me backstage, um, which I think tells you quite a bit about um, Dr. Shapiro and his commitments. Um, of course, when the various folios circulate. Many other rare books are brought out to accompany them. At the Fraser, you'll be able to see a Shakespeare fourth folio, the first published Shakespeare edition from, or the first published uh, in the North America, and a Ben Jonson uh, first folio. Uh, Professor Shapiro happens to own a rather beat up old copy of the Ben Jonson first folio with no covers or anything else. When the New York exhibition of the first folio took place, uh, Professor Shapiro loaned uh, his copy of the Ben Jonson first folio to the New York Public Library, or the New York Historical Society, wasn't it? Um, but the terms of the gift were that every student coming in to see the first folio would have a chance to touch and turn the pages of the Ben Jonson first folio. <laughs> and that it had to be returned to him in worse shape than he loaned it out. Ladies and gentlemen, James Shapiro and Shakespeare in America. What a lovely welcome to uh, Louisville. My first time in the city. I hope not, my last. Can you hear me okay in the back? <clears throat> if I fade for any reason, use the universal sign for we no longer hear you. Um, I'm going to speak for 48 minutes. <laughs> <clears throat> and that will allow me 13 and a half minutes <clears throat> to engage in Q&A, because this is a really good time in our nation's history to engage in Q&A, and I don't want to lose out on that. Uh, I'll speak at my normal New York clip, so you'll have to bear with me if that's a little faster than you are used to. <laughs> <clears throat> the story of Shakespeare in America, when it has been told, which is less often than you would think, tends to be recounted in two ways. The first way is a kind of version of Benedict and Beatrice in, in Shakespeare's wonderful Much Ado About Nothing. And that version goes something like this. In the distant past, there was a powerful attraction between America and England's national poet. But before anything came of it, 
they went their separate ways until at last they rediscovered each other, fell in love, and discovered how happily matched they really were, and ever since have been inseparable. <laughs> There's another version, and that's the version uh, argued for by a terrific cultural critic named Lawrence Levine, who wrote a, a book called Highbrow, Lowbrow, which is about cultural hierarchy in America. And that one has a, a less cheerful ending. It's more like a, a paradise lost story. And according to this version of the history of Shakespeare in America, everything was going great in the mid-19th century. Shakespeare was read across the country, across classes. When de Tocqueville came upon a cabin out west, he discovered a Bible and Shakespeare and recognized that everyone loved Shakespeare in this country. Until one day, and that one day was May 10th, 1849, the Astor Place riots took place in my native city of New York. And that was essentially white collar New Yorkers creating a riot in defiance of a British production of Macbeth. The guard was called out, shots fired, over a score of New Yorkers were killed, over a hundred were injured, and that, according to this version of Shakespeare in America, marked the end of that happy, collective love of Shakespeare. They're both wonderful narratives. Over time, and having spent the last few years putting together an anthology about Shakespeare and America, and teaching and lecturing about Shakespeare in this country, I've increasingly come to the conclusion that neither of these narratives quite works, nor do they account for what one comes upon when you read the many American stories and poems and essays about Shakespeare. So tonight I'd like to offer up a provisional third way to think about how and why Shakespeare has mattered in this country. There are things that we as Americans tend not to talk about or not to talk about very well. Mostly the things that continue to divide us. And as recent events have shown, we remain in many ways a divided country. Sometimes we don't want to talk about these things because we really disagree vehemently about them. Sometimes we don't talk about them because we can't quite articulate what they are. And sometimes we can't talk about them because we're not honest enough with ourselves to admit the ways in which sometimes we believe one thing and say another. My argument this evening then is that American poets and playwrights, novelists and presidents have turned to Shakespeare time and again to work out what they can't express any other way or quite so clearly or honestly. Shakespeare then serves as a touchstone, and we as Americans continue to look to his works to test sometimes harsh and otherwise suppressed truths about ourselves. I'd like to flesh out this argument <clears throat> uh, with four brief case studies, and uh, I hope through briefly touching on what they have, these authors have written about Shakespeare, to persuade you that Shakespeare has occupied a distinctive place in an America that has long struggled with what divides us, whether the issues are race relations, immigration, that is, who counts as one of us, who gets to speak Shakespeare's words, paternalism, even the industrial workplace. And some of the most exciting writing, as I hope to show, has come about when dealing with several of these divisive issues at once. Shakespeare remains as necessary and as meaningful to us as ever in identifying and perhaps even helping us navigate past these divisions in the years ahead. The most striking example of how Shakespeare has spoken to our divisions is evident in the fate of, to my mind, the finest reader of Shakespeare this country has ever known, a native of Hardin County in Kentucky, born in 1809, of course, familiar to you as Abraham Lincoln. 
Among the few books that Lincoln had access to while growing up were the works of Shakespeare, and he read and valued them throughout his life. His son Robert recalled that Lincoln would carry a copy of Shakespeare's works around the White House, even as he had carried a copy earlier in his career on the judicial circuit. And the president's secretary, John Hay, reported how Lincoln would read aloud from the plays late at night. We catch a glimpse of Lincoln's familiarity with the plays from the recollection of the artist Francis Carpenter, who remembered how Lincoln, when he grew bored sitting for a painting, recited Richard III's opening soliloquy <laughs> with a degree in force that made it seem like a new creation, Carpenter wrote. And to Carpenter's further surprise, Lincoln, still bored, also quoted from memory Claudius's guilt-ridden speech in Hamlet. Oh, my offense is rank. Lincoln also quoted Shakespeare sparingly in public, but to the point. In his first inaugural address, March 4th, 1861, he borrowed from Hamlet's most famous soliloquy, the one to which the Folger Shakespeare traveling edition is now open, the to be or not to be speech, when Lincoln said, will you hazard so desperate a step while there is any possibility that any portions of the ills you fly from have no real existence? Will you, while the certain ills you fly to are greater than all the real ones you fly from? It's encouraging at this moment to think of an inhabitant of the White House reading and turning to Shakespeare. <laughs> One of the great ironies, then, is that the man who assassinated him, John Wilkes Booth, a flyer for one of whose productions in 1862 is out in the hallway that you passed on your way in. In April 1865, Wilkes Booth was an accomplished Shakespeare actor who had recently performed the part of Brutus in a production in New York City of Julius Caesar. And in a letter that John Wilkes Booth left after he assassinated Lincoln, he quoted Brutus's words in that play. Oh, then that we could come by Caesar's spirit and not dismember Caesar, but alas, Caesar must bleed for it. Lincoln's life and his murder exemplify the ways in which Shakespeare's words have been woven into the fabric of our nation's often dark history. Before turning to my case studies to illustrate what I mean about what is so distinctive about American responses to Shakespeare, I'd like to describe a nearly forgotten Shakespeare performance that took place about 150 years ago. And it took place in Corpus Christi, Texas. Anybody here hail from Corpus Christi? I, I apologize in advance then for what I'm about to say. <laughs> in January 1846, over half of the US Army was gathered there, the largest troop concentration since the War of 1812. And they'd been sent there to provoke a war with Mexico after Congress had annexed Texas as a slave state. Such a war, if successful, would likely lead to the creation of even more slave states. Mexico did not practice slavery. This was a controversial military campaign, one that would, opponents warned, lead inexorably to civil war over the question of slavery, although it was defended as part of our manifest destiny, a phrase created at just this time. Now, whatever their views of the politics of this mission, the soldiers who had been sent to Texas had too much time on their hands as they sat around waiting orders to cross the Rio Grande and commence hostilities. One of the officers described Corpus Christi at the time as, and I quote, the most murderous, thieving, gambling, cutthroat, godforsaken hole in Texas, <laughs> which must be something. <laughs> now, in order to distract the idle troops, Captain John Magruder oversaw the building of a playhouse called the Union Theater. It could hold about 800 spectators. And he and the other officers, officers fell to work painting sceneries and rehearsing plays, including Shakespeare's Othello. 
In retrospect, it seems an excruciatingly apt choice, for it was a play that mercilessly explores what it means to be a white woman in love with a black man who himself had been enslaved, a play about the costs of war and soldiership set in the crossroads of empire. Admission to the Union Theater wasn't cheap. It cost a dollar for a, a, a seat and 50 cents for a place in the pit, but the productions sold to full houses and quickly paid off the cost of the playhouse. A young officer named Theodoric Porter was chosen to play Othello the Moor, and James Longstreet, familiar to many of you as one of the great Confederate generals in the Civil War and uh, a commander at Gettysburg, uh, he was initially chosen to play the part of Desdemona since all they had were male officers to play the part. But Longstreet was about my height and weight and deemed inappropriate for the part of Desdemona. So they looked around for an officer who was a little smaller and they found one who was about five, seven, 135 pounds and they persuaded him, if he needed much persuasion, to play the part of Desdemona and his name was Ulysses S. Grant. <laughs> in, in later years, I know, I know, and I did a lot of research on this, and Grant had just written to his fiancée that uh, he had a beard that was now about an inch or two, so I need you, as I'm describing this, to imagine Grant in a dress, rehearsing the part of Desdemona with a pretty substantial beard. Longstreet gave an interview, which is now in the uh, University of Southern California Library, uh, describing many of the events from the Civil War and pre-war. And he recalled this production, and he said of Grant that, I quote, he looked very like a girl dressed up. He really rehearsed the part of Desdemona, but he did not have much sentiment. <laughs> Grant apparently didn't, he just, also didn't work for Theodoric Porter, who was a close friend of Grant. And uh, in the end, uh, they had to send to New Orleans for a professional woman actor to play the part. Her name was Gertrude Hart. Um, Porter, Longstreet said, thought it was bad enough to play the part with a woman in the cast, but he couldn't pump up any sentiment with Grant dressed up as Desdemona. <laughs> now the staging, the staging of Othello in Corpus Christi invites more questions than the few surviving details of this production can begin to answer. Not least of all is, why stage Othello? And since it was Othello, how did the production speak to its time and place? For inevitably, the playgoers of Corpus Christi responded in markedly different ways than we might today. It is a military play, after all, one that is about the soldier's life. So I don't want to dismiss the complexity of that choice. But for these men performing and watching Othello, these soldiers, it was also inescapably about race. And the American soldiers in Corpus Christi were well aware that the decision to send them to fight, and for a sixth of them, including Theodoric Porter, who would be one of the first to die in what Grant later called a wicked and unjust Mexican war, he was driven in part to extend the reach of slavery. Spectators throughout antebellum America, a nation at this point hurtling towards civil war over the question of race, certainly saw Othello through a different lens than British audiences at this time. The British Parliament had formally abolished slavery in the British Empire in 1833, and black actors, including an American, Ira Aldridge, had been playing Othello on the London stage since 1825. Over a century would pass before Paul Robeson, an African-American, would be able to play the part of Othello on the Broadway stage. And I often reflect when thinking about this story of Corpus Christi, what effect playing a woman in love with the Moor had on the future commander and president. Ulysses S. Grant. Now you would think that a play about a black general eloping with a white woman would have been unpopular, if not taboo, in slave states. The opposite was true. In the quarter century before the Civil War, 
Othello was regularly staged in the South, 20 times in Memphis, twice that many times in Mobile, Alabama. Strong evidence that white Southerners could turn the blind eye towards the play's portrayal of so incendiary an issue as miscegenation, which is inescapable no matter how heavily edited the script or how much the hero's skin color was lightened in what Shakespeare scholars call the Bronze Age of Othello's. <laughs> Yet in the same antebellum South, it was unremarkable that a slave could be named after Shakespeare's tragic hero, as we learn from the notice of a, quote, lusty runaway Negro boy called Othello that was posted in the South Carolina Gazette. One wonders how many readers noted the irony that this man's Shakespearean namesake had himself been, quote, sold to slavery before he was redeemed, Shakespeare tells us, from that condition. It was only after the outbreak of the war that productions of Othello quickly fell out of favor in the South, presumably because it was no longer possible to see the play in such blinkered ways, except that merely imagining that race wasn't an issue in the play and in America was no longer tenable. One of the last had, uh, holdouts was a, a very talented woman writer named Mary Preston from uh, Maryland, who, uh, lamenting the defeat of the Confederacy, wrote a powerful essay about Shakespeare's play in which she concludes, Othello was a white man. <laughs> the first of my case studies, also about Othello, a play that continues to haunt us and tells us a little bit about what divides us as Americans, uh, was written by John Quincy Adams. John Quincy Adams was the sixth president of the United States, and he wrote an essay called The Character of Desdemona, and he wrote it in 1835. He would not only serve as sixth president of the United States, but afterwards as a congressman from Massachusetts, and he grew up in a household steeped in Shakespeare. Adams' anti-slavery record was matched by very few Americans. He famously attacked slaveholding from the floor of the House. He defended African Americans before the Supreme Court in the case of the United States versus Amistad. And he vocally opposed the war in Mexico that I've been talking about a few minutes ago. His credentials as an abolitionist were at the time, impeccable, and he hoped to be remembered in his own words as the acutest, the astutest, the archest enemy of Southern slavery that ever existed. Now, you would think that with such a track record on this issue, Adams would invoke Othello to offer a staunch defense of the young woman who turned down the curled darlings of her nation to marry the Moor. It's a bit shocking, then, to turn to his essay and discover that for Adams, Slavery was one thing, an abstraction. Sexual relations between blacks and whites, something else entirely. And I'll quote a little bit from his essay so you get a sense of the vehemence with which he held these two positions. My objections to the character of Desdemona, he writes, arise not from what Iago or Rodrigo or Brabantio <laughs> or Othello say of her but what from she herself does. She absconds from her father's house in the dead of night to marry a blackamoor. She breaks her father's heart and covers his noble house with shame. To gratify what? Pure love, like that of Juliet or Miranda? No, a natural passion. It cannot be named with delicacy. Her admirers now say, and I'm still quoting, this is criticism of 1835, that the color of Othello has nothing to do with the passion of Desdemona? No. Why, if Othello had been white, what need would there have been for her to run away with him? She could have made no better match. Her father could have made no reasonable objection to it. And there could have been no tragedy. If the color of Othello is not as vital to the whole tragedy as the age of Juliet is to her character and destiny, then I read Shakespeare in vain. Back to my voice. <laughs> Adam's reflections on Othello capture the contradictions of ostensibly liberal antebellum views of slavery and of interracial marriage. Follow the logic of his argument 
and you are left with a society in which slaves are free, just not free to choose who they might want to marry, nor at liberty to fall in love with somebody whose skin color is lighter or darker. What's so striking is not that Adams could write a piece today that reads as racist and patriarchal in the extreme. Rather, it's that he felt compelled to write this because his political and ideological arguments didn't square with the complex personal feelings he had about race, and that Shakespeare provided an acceptable outlet for writing so honestly and self-revealingly, however depressing it is for us to contemplate this today. Adams was keen on avoiding any ambiguity and concludes by hammering home his main points. First, and I quote, that the passion of Desdemona for Othello is unnatural solely and exclusively because of his color. Second, that, is, that her elopement to him and secret marriage with him indicate a personal character, not only very deficient in delicacy, but totally regardless of filial duty, of female modesty, and of shame. Third, that a deficiency in delicacy is discernible in her conduct and discourse throughout the play. He just trashes Desdemona. It's disheartening to read and reread Adams, so staunch an opponent of slavery, concluding his essay by declaring that the moral of Shakespeare's play Othello is that the intermarriage of black and white blood is a violation of the law of nature. That is the lesson to be learned from the play. It's interesting to me that his deep discomfort with the play was shared by his mother, Abigail Adams, another strong opponent of slavery, who after in London seeing Sarah Siddons play Desdemona opposite John Philip Kemble in 1785, wrote to one of her friends, quote, my whole soul shuddered whenever I saw the sooty moor touch fair Desdemona. And this, even though John Philip Kemble was playing the part in blackface. So easy distinctions between liberal and illiberal North and South have to be challenged, questioned, and rethought. My second case study turns on another great Shakespeare tragedy, King Lear. And it was written in 1895 by a wonderful writer an American intellectual and uh, social reformer, Jane Addams. And she wrote an essay, too little known, called A Modern Lear. Adams, probably remembered, if at all today, as a political and social reformer, had, become, had begun writing about Shakespeare while she was still an undergraduate. But even her deep familiarity with Shakespeare's works do little to prepare us for the brilliance of her essay, A Modern Lear, in which she reads Shakespeare's tragedy against the recent and bloody Pullman strike. We in America know far too little about the industrial protests of the 19th century, but uh, this was one of the most famous. George Pullman was in the railroad car building business, and he amassed a tremendous fortune doing this. And he built a small town just outside of Chicago. And he called that town Pullman. And he required all his workers to live in Pullman. And when they wanted to buy utilities, they bought it from Pullman. And when they wanted to buy food or anything else, they bought it from Pullman. Well, in 1895, there was a slump in the economy and in the railway business. And he had to lay off workers. But he refused to charge them less rent or alleviate the suffering, or ask for less than they had been paying him. And the civic leaders of Chicago reached out to him, and he insisted that he would not bend, that he was a man more sinned against than sinning. And the workers rose up, and uh, those of you familiar with this part of American labor history know that uh, it was violently suppressed. This was both the transportation system and the communication system in this country. President Grover Cleveland would not allow this, and federal troops were sent in. Adams was part of the elite in Chicago, Jane Adams. She knew Pullman. She reached out to him, but he rebuffed her suggestions as well. So she sat down and wrote this essay. And drawing analogies between this 
industrial strike and Shakespeare's tragedy, King Lear. And one of the things that I find so fascinating about this essay, which is one of the most brilliant uh, essays and anticipates the new historicism of the 1980s and 90s that was so prevalent in Shakespeare's studies that looked at Shakespeare through a political lens, is that she both did that and explored it through a personal lens as well. She was saddled with a father who wouldn't let her go far away from home to college. And uh, she understood very well what a patriarchal figure like King Lear really was. And when you read her essay, it's almost impossible to tell when she's talking about King Lear, when she is talking about Pullman, and when she is talking about her father. And she had a very clear sense of how the labor disputes and the family structures in America ran, if you will, on the same tracks. For Adams, the Pullman strike was truly a modern King Lear because, as she writes, Pullman's feudal virtue, benevolence, is too archaic to accomplish anything in late 19th century America. The word democracy never appears in her essay, but it's really about the moral view that undergirds democracy and produces justice. Towards the end of her essay, Adams writes, owing, however, to the unusual part played in it by the will of one man, we find that these recent events closely approach King Lear in motif. The relation of the British king to his family is very like the relation of the president of the Pullman Company to his town. The denouement of his daughter's break with her father suggests the break of the employees with their benefactor. If we call one the example of a domestic tragedy, the other of an industrial tragedy, it is possible to make them illuminate each other. And in a message that hasn't lost its force over a century later, Adams as Shakespeare in the end becomes a prescription, a warning for a way forward in American industrial and familial relations. And I quote again, if only a few families of the English-speaking race had profited by the dramatic failure of Lear, much heartbreaking and domestic friction might have been spared. Is it too much to hope that some of us will carefully consider this modern tragedy if perchance it may contain a warning for the troublous times in which we live. By considering the dramatic failure of the liberal employer's plans for his employees, we may possibly be spared useless industrial tragedies in the uncertain future which lies ahead of us. Pullman deeply resented this talk, this article, and uh, Jane Addams went around the country speaking mostly to women's groups, repeating this claim. She tried to see it into print, but Pullman had already called every leading newspaper and magazine editor in the country and made sure none of them would dare publish it. It was only published years later in a fourth-rate journal called The Survey in 1912. And even then, it stirred up controversy in American newspapers. Few writings about Shakespeare in America have so touched a nerve. John Dewey, one of the great philosophers and educators, called it one of the greatest things I've ever read as to its form and its ethical philosophy, and I would say the same. From Kentucky and Texas and Massachusetts and Illinois, I'll now turn to Oakland, California, where one of the first Japanese American writers, Toshio Mori, was born in 1910. Mori included a short story called Japanese Hamlet in a collection that he published in 1979 called The Chauvinist and Other Stories. And he dated it there to 1939. And I looked all over for writings in 1939 to find this extraordinary story. And thanks to the internet, where it's possible to do both good and bad things, I found the story published, and it was published in the house paper of the Topaz relocation camp, where Japanese Americans were interned during the Second World War. And they set up their own newspaper. And their newspaper was called, touchingly, The Pacific Citizen. And in the January 1846 issue of that paper, <coughs> 
there was a story, the same story, that appeared under a different name, not Japanese Hamlet, but the schoolboy Hamlet. For Japanese American readers, for whom it was directed in 1946, who were eager to return to their lives and prove themselves as loyal citizens in these post-war years, a story about a not-so-young man of 31, close to the age of Shakespeare's Hamlet, who also refuses to grow up in socially acceptable ways and dreams of becoming an actor and playing Shakespeare's greatest role on stage is aptly named Schoolboy Hamlet. But for the broader American reading public, Maury's new title, when republishing the story, was more apt because the protagonist, Tom Fukunaga, and his name split between half American and half Japanese, that Tom, the American part, the Fukunaga, the Japanese part, no matter how accomplished a Shakespeare actor he might be, would always be a Japanese Hamlet, his race an insuperable impediment to his American dreams. What's, for me, so wonderful about this gem of a story is that this glaring truth cannot be spoken, not even indirectly acknowledged, not by the unnamed narrator who first sympathizes with Tom and then turns against his unrealistic dream. For those of you, and I see any number of you who are my age and grew up in the, after, in the years after the war, you remember how Japanese were represented on Bugs Bunny or cartoons or in the media as yellow-faced, buck-tooth uh, individuals who spoke English in a funny way. So the very idea of a Japanese Hamlet in 1946 was quite simply unimaginable. Nonetheless, Tom Fukunaga persists, and the narrator describes how Tom used to come to the house <clears throat> and asked me to hear him recite the plays. And I quote, as his love for Shakespeare's plays grew with the years, he did not want anything else in the world but to be a Shakespeare actor. <clears throat> the story turns on the narrator's rejections of Tom's aspirations. Nobody really had the courage to tell him there's no way in mid-20th century America a Japanese man is going to be cast in the most iconic role in the Shakespeare canon. I'll read from the story's ending <clears throat> so that you get a sense of the subtlety of this simple and powerful story. I knew, <clears throat> I knew he would never, sorry, <clears throat> I knew he would never abandon his ambition. I was equally sure that Tom would never rank with the great Shakespeare actors but I could not forget his simple persistence. One day, years later, I saw him on the Piedmont car on 14th and Broadway in San Francisco. He was sitting with his head buried in a book, and I was sure it was a copy of Shakespeare's. For a moment, he looked up and stared at me as if I were a stranger. Then his face broke into a smile, and he raised his hand. I waved back eagerly. How are you, Tom? I shouted. He waved his hand politely again, but he did not get off and the car started up Broadway. That street's name is perfectly chosen, for that's the only Broadway where this Asian American lover of Shakespeare will ever get to recite Hamlet's words. <clears throat> the last of my four case studies dates from 1962. Mary McCarthy's brilliant and savage essay, General Macbeth. McCarthy is yet another American writer steeped in Shakespeare. She herself claimed to have majored in Elizabethan literature when she was an undergrad at Vassar. She's best known as a novelist and as an essayist and social critic, but she was also a terrific theater reviewer for the Partisan Review. Her reading of Macbeth in 1962 turns received wisdom about that play on its head. Rather than accepting the conventional academic view, one that most of us were force-fed when reading Shakespeare's Macbeth in high school, that Macbeth is a hero possessed of vision and of imagination, McCarthy suggests instead that his tragedy resides in his literal mindedness, that he is no more a familiar modern and bourgeois type, superstitious and credulous. He's the eternal executive whose main concern throughout the play is to get a good night's sleep, and whose savvy wife 
who sees him for what he is, a shallow mix of fear and ambition, can barely mask her impatience and contempt for him. I'll read you a bit of McCarthy's brilliant prose. He is a general and has just won a battle. He enters the scene making a remark about the weather, so foul and fair a day I have not seen. On this flat note, Macbeth's character is set. Terrible weather we're having. Sun can't seem to make up its mind. Is it hot or cold enough for you? He's a commonplace man who talks in commonplaces. A golfer, one might guess, on the Scottish fairways. If McCarthy has one take on General Macbeth, she has another on his all too intelligent wife, trapped like so many dutiful spouses in this madman era, has, who has to live her life through her husband's. It's a really wicked passage, one that's fun to read, so I'll read it to you. <laughs> Lady Macbeth takes very little stock in the witches. She never pesters her husband, as most wives would, with questions about the weird sisters. What did they say exactly? How did they look? Are you sure? She's interested in fate and metaphysical aid more interested in that than in the business at hand, had a nerve her husband to do what he wants to do. And later, when Macbeth announces that he's going out to consult the weird sisters again, she refrains from comment, as though she were keeping her opinion, oh, proper stuff, to herself. Lady Macbeth is not superstitious. Her husband is. This makes her repeatedly impatient with him. For Macbeth, like many men of his sort, is an old story to his wife, a tale full of sound and fury, <laughs> signifying nothing. A contempt for him perhaps extends even to his ambition. Would's not play false and yet would wrongly win, as though to say, all right, if that's what you want, have the courage to get it. Lady Macbeth does not so much give the impression of coveting the crown herself as of being weary of watching Macbeth covet it. Macbeth, by the way, is her second husband, and neither her first was a better man, which calls her, who is just another general, another superstitious golfer, which would gall her too. <laughs> the moral of McCarthy's story, and I quote, is that ambition, fear, and a kind of stupidity make a deadly combination. When the McCarthy sees around her in modern day leaders, all too willing to unloose the potential destructiveness that was always there in nature. In recasting the plays in contemporary terms, McCarthy turns the domestic dynamics of the Macbeths into a familiar American suburban story and the politics of the play into a mirror of the Cold War world. It's no surprise that Mary McCarthy's good friend, Hannah Arendt, who came across General Macbeth when it first appeared in Harper's Magazine, while she was at work on her own study of a banal and evil figure, Adolf Eichmann, wrote to McCarthy, I fell greatly and enthusiastically in love with the Macbeth article. It's the banality of Macbeth that no doubt drew a rent to General Macbeth, a quality underscored in McCarthy's conclusion. And I'll read one last quote. If that's not a monster like Richard III or Iago or Iacomo, though in the catalog he might go for one, because of the blackness of his deeds. But at the outset, his deeds are only the wishes and fears of the average, undistinguished man translated into half-hearted action. Pure evil is a kind of transcendence that he doesn't aspire to. He only wants to be king and sleep the sleep of the just, undisturbed. He could never have been a good man, even if he had not met the witches. Hence, we cannot see him as a devil incarnate, for the devil is a fallen angel. You can search in vain through the cultural criticism of the day, or for that matter, through the new critical Shakespeare criticism that held sway in the academy at the time, and steer as clear as it could of the topical and the historical and the political for so true a portrait of that age in America, of America's cold war mentality, of the stultifying nature of domestic life for so many American women, for an undistinguished man, an American type, familiar to us all, who craves power and finally attains it. It took Shakespeare, once again, <clears throat> to give a local habitation to this and a name. The same holds true, I discovered, when American authors grappled with flying fighter jets in Vietnam, 
or facing the drudgery of the daily suburban commute or staring at the ruins of the Twin Towers. And I expect that future generations <clears throat> of American writers will continue in these troubled times to turn to Shakespeare's work when struggling to define where we have come from, where we are now, and where, as a nation, we are heading. Thank you. <clears throat> I've sunk for my supper. Now we get to talk. <laughs> Sir, stand up. Here's how it's going to work. <clears throat> You're going to ask a question. Those in the back won't hear it, so I will repeat the question. And if it is a difficult question, I'll turn it into a simpler one that I can answer. <laughs> and if it's a statement, I'll turn it into a question that I can answer. Go ahead. Thank you, John, my friend from Louisville. There's an internet trope that says the quality of an argument is directly proportional. Those are three great points, and I'll handle the first one first. I, I think we have to, and I didn't use the word Nazi very particularly, because I think that is a word now, and there are words that end conversation. And I'm interested in the next four years <clears throat> in making sure that conversation, conversation continues. And one of the ways that I can help make that happen is through Shakespeare. Because there are not many things that those on the cultural left and cultural right both believe and are right to believe they own. Shakespeare is owned by all of us. And the history of Shakespeare in America tells a complicated and checkered story but it's one that we all have a share in. Now to the question of Shakespeare in other countries and the universality of Shakespeare. I spend a lot of time traveling the world. In the last 18 months, I've been in South America, India, Europe. Shakespeare is of great interest wherever you travel in the world. But it's always particular. The fantasy we have is that Shakespeare means the same thing everywhere. In fact, as implicit in my talk, American Shakespeare has very little to do with British Shakespeare or Irish Shakespeare or Israeli Shakespeare. And the best way I can answer your question is to give an anecdote that for me is a very powerful example. I was, um, I was in Tel Aviv in 1994 and um, there was a production of The Merchant of Venice on all in Hebrew. My Hebrew's pretty good, but it was still a little weird going to see a production of The Merchant of Venice where all the actors were Jews and it was spoken in Hebrew. <laughs> and one of the, the remarkable things about this production was Shalak began as a kind of secular Jew dressed in a nice suit, an Armani suit, and um, clean shaven. But by the middle of the play, when his daughter uh, abandons him and he becomes radicalized, he turned into a religious right-wing settler type of Jew. Quite frightening, spraying his enemies with an imaginary Uzi machine gun. And the reason the director chose to do this was a fellow Brooklynite, a man named Barack Goldstein, who went to the same elementary school as I did and was a year younger than I, had gone into the mosque in Hebron, or the Tomb of the Patriarchs, rather, and had killed 20 Palestinians and injured others before the survivors of that attack turned on him and killed him. And the director chose to make this production about that and about a radicalized Shylock. And about seven or eight months after this production, a couple of hundred yards from that theater, a young man, very much cut in the same cloth as that Shylock, gunned down Yitzchak Rabin in one of those odd moments where life imitates art. That production understood that something was seething in that culture. And Shakespeare began to be a way of clarifying darker social currents within that <coughs> society, quite particular to that society, that found their way in that violence from which Israel has never, to my mind, fully recovered. So I am always interested in Shakespeare not as a universal artist, but Shakespeare as a particular one. And as an American, I care a great deal about what he means in this country 
over time from 70, 1776 until today. Next question, sir, in the red. That's a great question. At a time where uh, 144 characters seems to be the appropriate length or maximum length for any successful communication, what place does Shakespeare have in our world? I'll give a two-part answer to that. One is, I can't sit through four-hour Shakespeare productions, and neither did Elizabethans. Shakespeare speaks of the two-hour traffic of our time, and many, many productions come close to doubling that today. So I think that a disincentive is to encourage young people to sit through interminable productions. Uh, and I hated Shakespeare in high school. I never took, I had the worst Shakespeare experience, I never took a college course on Shakespeare because I was so turned off to Shakespeare by my Midwood High School education in Romeo. I didn't even get the dirty bits. I mean, I was, it, was, it, was not, it was not a good experience. My experience was seeing great productions. And I spent a lot of my time working with fourth graders, working with the public theater, working with as many groups as I can to get people to see productions of Shakespeare. And hearing Andrew describe earlier how many productions were available is fantastic. And my advice to you is people will live on Facebook, people will go to their Twitter feed, but if you have an engaging production of Shakespeare, take young people to it. My own experience was I was bumming around Europe with my brother in my late teens, sleeping in youth hostels. We didn't have a lot of money. We went to see Shakespeare productions with our student discounts. And for me, it was like a drug. And it was cheaper than the other drugs available at the time. <laughs> and it has become the most addictive drug in my life. And, uh, a way of understanding myself and my world. And the more young people we can encourage to do that, I think the better country we'll be living in. In the back, ma'am. Can you please share with us your perspective? The question is, can I please share with you my hostility towards the <laughs> Oregon? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I wrote the Oregon Shakespeare Festival for those uh, is one of the great Shakespeare institutions in this country and has been producing outstanding Shakespeare for the past 75 years. A uh, Silicon Valley uh, uh, billionaire, millionaire, one of those people, went to Oregon and discovered he didn't understand the plays. And rather than hiring Andrew or Stephen Greenblatt or Peter Holland to privately tutor him so that he might <laughs> understand those plays, he decided, let's dumb them down, and I will give millions of dollars to translate these plays into modern American idiom. And um, I wrote about this in an op-ed in the New York Times, so I won't go into all the details, but I'll tell you this. Uh, part of my work for the public theater is going into prisons. In the last three months, you know, Rikers, the Orange is the New Black Women's Prison in Westchester, New York, federal prisons in Brooklyn and Manhattan, and these are not happy places. But we bring equity-trained actors, nationally illustrious directors, into those prisons and perform Shakespeare's works in 90-minute productions. It's, and um, it's God's work, I have to say. And one of the, I just saw a Black Lives Matter production of Hamlet at a federal prison downtown. And there was an extraordinary moment when one of the leading actors for the Royal Shakespeare Company, Chuck Iwuji, was performing Hamlet. And uh, he comes to the to be or not to be speech. I'm not watching the production. I've seen it 18 times. I've been involved with it since first day of rehearsal. I'm just watching the playgoers to see if they get it. And there were 19 men in the room. We asked them beforehand, had any of them seen a play ever in their lives, and nine raised their hands. Two had seen a Shakespeare play. So this was not this audience. It was a very different one. And when Chuck, as Hamlet, goes into the to be or not to be soliloquy and takes off his belt and pulls up his sleeve and ties off 
before he talks about the bare bodkin and sleeping and dreaming and checking out through drugs. Checking out, I mean, turning from the world, you know, to sleep perchance to dream and, and all. And these men were wrapped in attention. And Shakespeare spoke with extraordinary immediacy to them. And I remember at Rikers being asked two questions before a production of Much Ado. How many plays Shakespeare wrote? I said, 35 or so. And was he still alive? <laughs> if inmates at a federal prison and prisoners at Rikers can get these plays, the folks at Aragon can get them. But they can only get them if the directors and the actors know what the words they are speaking mean. And that is the problem. And there are wonderful universities out there stocked with talented people who can help those productions far more than the money of an internet billionaire. And what saddens me is, I'll tell you the next thing that's going to happen. They'll collect all these editions, and all of a sudden, Argonne Shakespeare is going to sell this dumbed-down Shakespeare, and it'll be adopted in classrooms everywhere, and that internet guy is going to make his money back. It's already been purchased by the Utah Shakespeare Festival and the Alabama Shakespeare Festival. So I'm going to war with these guys <laughs> and won't rest easy. Let me take three more questions, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Not that young. I was wondering, are there any plays in particular that you'd recommend as someone who hasn't seen one yet? Sure. Uh, what plays would I recommend for young people? And uh, that's a terrific, terrific question. And the answer is, um, ask around. <laughs> if somebody you know can tell you to go see a good production, I see everything. I mean, I see everything. I've seen some of the worst Shakespeare ever <laughs> staged. And I always get something out of it. I mean, it, I can't even begin to go into that. But if you have the opportunity to see an exciting production, it'll change your life. I had a son who uh, uh, was described, I have a son who was described as unruly by his first grade teacher and he didn't pay attention. And I said, he's bored out of his mind. Why do you think he's not paying attention to you? And I said, let's just do an experiment. I'll take this six-year-old to see a production of Shakespeare, buy him a front row seat, and see whether his mind drifts after two minutes or 20. And it was a production by the Propeller Shakespeare Company of Midsummer Night's Dream, all male cast, absolutely brilliant. And um, Puck was throwing fairy dust on the first rows. And my son couldn't believe it. Nobody else was picking up the fairy dust and shoving it in their pockets. And he sat like somebody on an acid trip for three hours. And the next week, because he couldn't get enough of Midsummer, he said to me, you know, can we rent a video of it? And I got that bad Michelle Pfeiffer video of it. And he's watching me and he said, they just left out Puck's best line. Young people get Shakespeare. Ask around, go to a good production, go to anything in New York, take a road trip, go to see Free Shakespeare in the Park at the, the Delacour Theater in Central Park, 2,500 people a, a night. I work on those productions. I guarantee it'll change your life. This has been a Metro TV production.